I am A.M. Rosenthal, managing editor of the New York Times. I'm on camera now to introduce the pilot of a new series of television programs called Byline, the New York Times. The series will be produced as a joint venture of the New York Times Company and Horizons Communications Corporation. It will be a weekly half-hour series for syndication, a program designed to enlarge the coverage of news on television. It is not designed to compete with or replace either network or local news programs. Rather, it's intended to complement those programs by adding a new depth to television reportage and commentary. That new depth coming from the unique capability of the staff of the New York Times to convey information and express viewpoints which otherwise are not part of the programming patterns of television. It will augment the news coverage that is customary to television by introducing to this medium the product of the skills and special insights of a news staff that we think is unmatched in the world. It's a staff that has received 37 Pulitzer Prizes. It's a staff that could fill a small library with the books it's written. It's a staff that includes a playwright, a doctor, scientists, lawyers, explorers, several historians, an ordained Presbyterian minister, and some plain, very good reporters. It's a group of outstanding journalists and all of them will take part as either regular or occasional contributors to this television series. The program is conceived as an effort to bring mature consideration of the news to an increasingly interested and concerned and informed television audience. We think it will improve the public's understanding and appreciation of what is happening. It will stick close to the news each week, but it will not merely report, it will explain. And besides being informative, we hope it will be entertaining too. It will convey ideas as well as facts. It will judge the value of news. In short, we'll apply to this program our combined news judgment. Our aim is to present a verbal instead of a visual message, because after all, ideas are still often communicated best through words. We will deal with aspects of the news that cannot be photographed. That is, thoughts about the news. Each week, seven or eight and sometimes more members of our staff will appear on byline the New York Times. They'll bring to television more dimension in terms of content and more scope in terms of news coverage. As you know, the New York Times news service is subscribed to by more than 200 newspapers in North America and another 100 or more abroad. Byline the New York Times will be an additional news service supported by the worldwide news gathering facilities of our paper. And as a fill-up to that service, the program will allow the stations that carry it to take features from it and use them in their own news programs. For as you'll see, each feature will stand by itself, complete in its running time of three minutes or less. So next on this reel is the pilot of the program I've been talking about. It is an expansion of news coverage in a new medium for the New York Times. <laughs> This is the program that contains background reports, news analyses, and comprehensive commentaries prepared specially for television by correspondents, columnists, critics, and editors of the New York Times. In this edition, our byline writers range in subject matter from national politics to the campaign by pizza purveyors to destroy the hamburger, from an expert evaluation of the leadership qualities of current heads of state to a view from abroad on American attitudes toward truth and government from the sudden emergence of left-handers who now dominate bowling to a thoughtful appraisal of the turning tides of history according to the viewpoint of a confirmed optimist, plus this editor's explanation of the decision of the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers. This week, our datelines are New York, Washington, Philadelphia, London, and Paris. We bring you byline the New York Times after this commercial message. This is that very special season in Washington when everything political is done in the name of nonpartisanship. When every politician poses as a statesman and when the next presidential campaign, which is the preoccupation of everyone, is treated by all as if they never heard of it. President Nixon decreed the opening of this season the other night by ruling political questions out of order at his news conference. 
Senators Muskie, Humphrey, Jackson, Hughes, and Bai have joined in the spirit of the thing by running full-time campaign operations, but pretending that no one could possibly know his own ambitions this far in advance. Senator Kennedy insists that he is not a candidate, which may or may not be true, since he would be saying precisely that if he were or were not a candidate. Only Senator McGovern has announced, not because anyone had been left in doubt about him, but because all too many were already inclined to dismiss him. Now, more interesting than all this coquetry is that politics has also displaced the normal executive and legislative functions of our leading citizens. The Nixon administration is carefully measuring the withdrawal of troops from Vietnam and its stimulation of the economy so as to produce the greatest possible amount of peace and prosperity precisely on next election day. And just as the president was describing this as his non-political year in office, he sent off half his staff to a 1972 campaign headquarters across the street from the White House. As for the Democrats, they are feeling more than a faint amount of satisfaction every time the news, and particularly the economic news, is not too good. No one likes to profit from the misery of others, of course, so the Democrats in Congress are working up the most costly possible remedies to soothe the unemployed, but they watch that index of joblessness and price increases much more closely even than the public opinion polls. This business has gone so far that there's almost no activity in Washington that is not essentially political. Administration officials and members of Congress are for or against finding a cancer cure, ending the draft, reforming welfare, expanding health insurance, creating daycare centers, busing children to school, sharing revenue with the cities, and raising social security benefits for the single purpose of either holding or recapturing the White House. In short, after a six-month break-in period and a year and a half of creative policy making, the first term of the Nixon administration is over, save for the effort to win a second term. And after a year of struggle to defend their control of Congress, the Democrats have moved effortlessly from last year's campaign to next year's. To be precise about it, there are only 70 weeks left in this campaign. When I was a college freshman, we had a hypnotic history professor who used to say, War makes kings, and kings make war. This is not Marxist historical theory, and it certainly oversimplifies, but I think it is essentially true. In our age, however, kings tend to be abstract hangovers or political eunuchs. Today's king is the forceful leader, the giant, a man like Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, de Gaulle, or Mao Zedong. De Gaulle often told me it's only in times of crisis that nations throw up giants. They don't need them in normal times. When the situation is grave, the giants come nearer to a return. For de Gaulle, the giant was the efficient leader, the man who accomplished things. He called Stalin a grand figure, a tyrant, a real czar. He controlled everything. He had absolute authority and absolute confidence. He did something. He was a brutal man, but he created a modern state. Of Churchill, he said, a great man, he forged a victory. And of Roosevelt, he also was a great man. He was a man of quality. When I asked about latter-day figures, the general said, you cannot judge a man except in the light of achievement. If Khrushchev can achieve peace, he will be a great man. Or if he makes war and can win a war, he will be a great man. But if he does neither, he will not be great. He did neither. And although de Gaulle spoke with fatherly sympathy when he returned from President Kennedy's funeral, he told me at the time, history will probably say that he was a man of great ability who lacked the time to prove himself. Today we seem to be entering an age of mediocrity. Certainly, no one calls Nixon, Heath, Pompidou, or Brezhnev giants. Should we be disappointed by this less glamorous generation? I don't think so. The mere absence of giants is likely to reduce the possibility of war. And let's not forget that lesser figures often know how to apply power with modest wisdom. 
After Clement Attlee took over from Churchill in 1945, he ran Britain's toughest and most, of, most efficient modern government. When Roosevelt died, the torch was passed to the very prototype of American political mediocrity, Harry Truman. But Truman proved our most effective recent president. Giants make good journalistic copy, but smaller men may make better government and peace. I went down to Philadelphia the other day to meet with some people who are preparing to go to war. They are the people who make pizzas, and their enemy is the hamburger. About 300 pizza makers, their fingernails scrubbed clean of oregano and their tomato-stained aprons left at home, gathered in a Philadelphia hotel to map the battle plans. Their general was Thomas Ciccarelli, the dynamic 29-year-old executive director of the North American Pizza Association, which sponsored the one-day convention. Ciccarelli told me, our goal is simple, to make pizza numero uno. He said that the enemy, which includes the likes of Burger Chef and McDonald's, will be fought with slogans such as, ban the bun, help stamp out hamburgers, and power to the pizza, and man does not live by bread alone, let him eat pizza. There are other weapons too, including the Pizza Association's crusading monthly magazine called A Slice of Pizza. It recently told its 18,000 subscribers that the pizza is no longer a ch stepchild looked down upon as grubby and unfit to socialize with elite eateries. And then there is the official pizza button, a pink and orange creation festooned with a peace symbol and the words, and pizza. There is also an official t-shirt which bears the message, pizza makes me passionate. In the works, Mr. Ciccarelli said, is a syndicated comic strip called Super Pizza, whose heroes would include Peter Pepperoni and Mary Mozzarella. The villain? None other than Harry Hamburger. Despite the seeming levity of the convention, most of the pizza people had serious expressions on their faces as they sat for six hours listening to speeches made by experts and suppliers in the $4 billion a year pizza industry. There were a total of 15 speeches. Their titles included The Power of Flour and The Big Cheese and The Secret is in the Sauce. The speech makers were often put on the spot. After a representative of the green pepper industry had made his remarks, he was asked by Larry Goldberg, a Manhattan pizza maker, why green peppers sometimes come out of the can red. My customers sometimes get a little twitchy about it, Mr. Goldberg said. They think I gave them pimentos instead of green peppers. The green pepper man assured him that the red green peppers were just mature and that they tasted the same as the green ones. An informal poll of the pizza people indicated that the most popular flavor was still mushroom and sausage. But Mr. Ciccarelli said there was something new on the scene for people who are tired of the same old taste. It's the oddball pizza, he said. It can have everything on it from soup to nuts. There is the omelet pizza, the Hawaiian pizza with pineapple and ham, the hot dog pizza, and the chili con carne pizza. But despite all their noises, the pizza people have made some inroads on the enemy. Although a Gallup poll recently showed that the hamburger still leads the pizza in overall popularity, the pizza was number one with the 21 to 34-year-olds. That's the latest from Pizzadelphia, Pennsylvania. So far in this edition of Byline, the New York Times, you've heard from Max Frankel, chief of our Washington bureau, Cy Salzberger, foreign affairs columnist, and Judy Clemesrud, reporter on all kinds of interesting things. Upcoming are some thoughts by the chief of our London bureau, Tony Lewis, by our sports editor, Jim Roach, a thoughtful statement by James Reston, our Washington columnist. After that, I'll talk a bit about our decision to publish the Pentagon Papers. Byline, the New York Times, continues in one minute. For some strange reason, uh, doubtless connected with the continental metabolism, the ministers of the European Economic Community usually go on all night when they negotiate. In the middle of one of those marathons, uh, early one morning, a British diplomat rather groggily said to me, Someday we must have a little chat about the special relationship, but you should have a good meal first. It will not be so pleasant. He was, of course, talking about the special relationship between Britain and the United States that for so long has been a foundation of British politics. Every political leader, conservative or labor, has believed for many years that at difficult times he can reassure public opinion by visiting the American president or otherwise demonstrating transatlantic solidarity. General de Gaulle was certainly not wrong 
when he talked about Britain's instinctive dependence on the established alliance with her former colonies across the sea. But those days are over. Finished. That is what I would hear from that British diplomat if I ever got around to having a good dinner and a candid discussion with him. And it is a message that many Americans are going to have to understand. I don't mean to suggest that the British are becoming anti-American, that we are no longer loved over here or anything of that sort. Americans can still expect an immensely friendly welcome if they come to watch the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace or meet British people anywhere. But the politicians have changed. Britain is now moving toward membership in the European community. And like it or not, that is going to change a very great deal in diplomacy and psychology. When Britain enters the community, she will think about her European partners first instead of the United States. That means that American governments will no longer be able to rely so automatically on British support in a variety of important fields. Money matters, for example. With Britain inside, the common market will exert a large and independent influence on world monetary policy. The day of the dollar's supremacy, already declining, will be over. The United States will be called to account more quickly for policies that export our inflation to the rest of the world. And even on international security matters, there will be a changed relationship. If Britain had been in the common market when the Vietnam involvement began, for example, she could not and would not have so readily approved American policy, all of which is simply to say that things will be different for the United States as well as for Britain as the European community is enlarged. You know, of course, what Johnny Petralia of Brooklyn has in common with Alexander the Great and with Leonardo da Vinci, Charlemagne, Ben Franklin, and Casey Stengel. Johnny Petralia is left-handed, and he's the leader in a left-wing uprising that has the grand old game of bowling and a ring-tailed dither. The lefties are dominating the pro circuit on which prize money adds up to two million a year. Petralia already has broken a one-year record for bowling winnings, and he'll probably collect close to $100,000 in prizes this year. He won $25,000 in a year's richest tournament. And the big thing about that tournament, I guess, was that four of the five finalists were lefties. There was another tournament in which all of the last 16 were lefties. There was one a few days ago in which only the fourth place man among the first eight was a right-hander. What goes on? Well, it's the alleys, I'm assured. They get many times more use on the right than on the left. The United States Public Health Service study back in the 60s showed that 91% of the population was right-handed, 4% ambidextrous, 5% left-handed. In bowling, those figures mean that 90% of the rolls with the 10 to the 16-pound balls are on the right-hand side of the lanes. And those rolls in the 51 weeks a year before the pros arrive in town are made by men, women, teeny tots, experts, dubs, straight ball throwers, hook bowlers, curve bowlers, bounce bowlers, and my wife, who bowls what is known in the trade as a backup ball. The path between the foul line and the strike pocket varies from alley to alley. The super expert, the pro with his seeing eye ball that heads for the pocket nearly every time, finds his bowling thrown off as he endeavors to adjust to the track in the right-hand side of the alley. The left-hander finds his side of the alley comparatively unmarred. His role goes where he wants it to go. This left-right situation has bobbed up only in recent years. It used to be that alley owners resurfaced the lanes when they got too groovy. Now there's a harder finish. It gets harder and harder the longer it stays down. And costly resurfacing has gone out of style. The problem, for right-handers that is, can be beaten. Greatly improved maintenance is needed. It'll be costly, and it'll take time. And Johnny Petralia, for one, hopes that plenty of time is taken. I mentioned Casey Stengel, the most left-handed man I know. He even passes sentences left-handed. He was asked to describe lefties, and he said, quote, left-handers have much more enthusiasm for life. They sleep on the wrong side of the bed, and their heads become stagnant on that side, unquote. That bears thinking about. I don't know exactly what it means, but it bears thinking about, particularly by left-handers.
I know it's not very popular around here, but I want to make a couple of optimistic points about Washington. It seems to me that major trends and tendencies in the world at the present time are a whole lot better than the news and maybe a whole lot better uh, when we look at them than uh, most people think. Uh, first of all, the trend is toward peace in Vietnam. Uh, it is not moving as fast as you or I might like it to, but nevertheless, the boys are coming home. In the Middle East, there is a ceasefire. The bombers are not over Cairo. Uh, the guerrillas are not moving across the Golan Heights. Uh, third, uh, uh, in addition, we have, um, we have broken the negotiating stalemate in the disarmament talks uh, in Vienna and Helsinki. This means that perhaps on the most important question, fiscal question, and military question in the world. With the cost of arms running at over $200 billion a year, we are finally making a little progress toward controlling the arms race. Uh, more important even than that, perhaps, is that China is beginning to come out of isolation and talk about the great questions of trade and order in the world. Uh, another great factor uh, on this optimistic uh, catalog, as I see it, uh, is that Britain is at last coming into uh, the common market in Europe. And in my judgment, at least, uh, I think that historians at the end of the century will say that this move by the British uh, in toward political unity in Europe is one of the great events of the last 50 years. Then, of course, there's Berlin. Uh, not so long ago, we were afraid that this was going to be the great flashpoint in the world. Today, it is composed, and of course, because it's quiet, nobody ever says anything else, anything about it. Well, it seems to me that this adds up to something. At least, it is not disaster. The news is about what went wrong yesterday. But the trends, the historic trends of the day, I think are much better. In short, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, the pessimists will give you a totally different picture, and they, be, they may be right. I just happen to think that there are some very strong and powerful tides uh, moving in the world, and that you might even say there are some signs that common sense may be breaking out here and there. There's been an enormous amount of debate about the decision of the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers. On the newspaper itself, there's no doubt that it was the most important decision we ever took. And it was taken after a great deal of soul searching and probably more discussion than about any other decision in the paper's history. Sometimes we talked through the night in our offices and in our homes. We were confronting a step that struck to basic issues in American life and to the destiny of our own paper, and we knew it. By now, millions of words have been spoken or written about that decision. The debate went to the Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of the constitutional right to publish. We've received a heavy amount of support for the decision, and we've received a substantial amount of criticism. For a while, the decision to publish and the great constitutional struggle that it brought about seemed to overshadow the substance of the Pentagon Papers themselves. What is the importance of the papers to historians and to the readers we asked to wade through those huge oceans of type? The more I think about them, the more I realize that the answer is really philosophic, having to do with the strange and frightening lockstep of history. The men who shape governments and turn the course of history are locked into the time frame of their period of power. They are prisoners of decisions made before their time, and they themselves imprison their successors by the decisions they take in office. And yet, they can see behind them only dimly, and ahead of them not at all. I think of the Pentagon Papers as a box labeled 30 years of American history. Publication of the papers allowed us to lift the cover off the box and peer down. There are the men of power, talking and acting and deciding. But always they are talking and deciding inside their own compartments over which they cannot look into the past or into the future. But the reader can. He can see it all. The reader looking down has an advantage no president, no general, no intelligence chief ever had while in power. The reader can see from one compartment to another. He watches a decision taken by President Eisenhower that the Geneva Conventions were a disaster. 
Then he looks over into President Kennedy's compartment and sees him making decisions based on what went on in the Eisenhower time frame. He sees into President Johnson's compartment and sees him walled in by Kennedy decisions with results that people in the Kennedy compartment could never have foretold. He sees one army commander making decisions growing inexorably out of the foresights or failures of a general or a politician or a whiz kid 10 years before. It's almost like one of those time warps that science fiction writers love so dearly. But it deals with real people and real tragedies and provides a deeper insight into the extent and limitations of power than was ever available before. For men of vision, it will provide lessons about the uses and imprisonments of power. And that is the justification for the decision to publish the Pentagon Papers. And that closes out this edition of Byline, the New York Times. Each week at this time, we will present correspondents, columnists, critics, and editors from the staff of the New York Times, men and women whose insight, knowledge, and skill as reporters and observers will, we think, contribute to understanding and appreciation of the news. I am A.M. Rosenthal, Managing Editor. just seen as a pilot program for the weekly series titled Byline the New York Times. The pilot represents what we expect to be a typical program in the series. From time to time, however, we intend to devote an entire program to a single theme. On the eve of a national election, for example. Or say when in our judgment it's advisable to present a worldwide roundup of reaction to a momentous event in the news. But ordinarily, will assemble contributions from members of the staff of the New York Times whose areas of expertise might range from motion pictures to monetary crises or from civil liberties to science or from political and social strife in Northern Ireland to the kind of religious services in the White House during Nixon's presidency. So to demonstrate the variety we could have covered in the pilot, but didn't because of lack of time, we've arranged an epilogue featuring some other members of our staff who will appear in the series and who have done sample pieces for us for this very purpose. I'd like to tell you about an underground church. Like most others, it's in a private home. There are no crosses or religious symbols. The preachers range from baseball players to college presidents. The liturgy, at best, is unorthodox and full of contradictions. It's the sort of thing that could offend any orthodox believer except for one thing. This one takes place in the East Room of the White House. Richard Nixon has added a new page to American religious history by holding regular worship services in his home. The idea was apparently his own. For centuries, no heavenly body has evoked so much curiosity and speculation as the planet Mars. And now three automated explorers are on their way, and when they arrive in November and December, they may answer that age-old question, is there life elsewhere than on Earth? Mars does not look as hospitable as it did a few years ago when we knew less about it, but many believe life may exist there, and if it does, the philosophical as well as scientific implications will be enormous. And there is little effect so far in the Catholic slum streets. In such an environment, the Catholics, at the least, acquiesce in the terrorism of the underground Irish Republican Army, which is out with guns and bombs in Belfast night after night. The 10,000 British troops on hand can stop riots, but not the terror. Protestant extremists are badgering the government to take a tougher line, but the government is fearful of arousing the entire Catholic population. Ulster is a depressing place. They sometimes share the same platform, but by and large, black women and white women do not see eye to eye on the issue of women's liberation. 
Not that black women aren't concerned with some of the same issues, but the differences are rooted in historical traditions that have placed black women in terms of work, family life, education, and men in a relationship quite apart from that of white women. It is not easy to sketch quickly my five-week sortie into China, which ended on June 24th. I found China a world so different that it could be of another planet. There were the great cities, Shanghai or Shenyang and Manchuria, where hundreds of Chinese gathered each day before my hotel, hoping for a glimpse of the American. There was a vastness in which 800 million people manicure their land with a loving intensity I bestow on my rose garden. For a while there, it looked as if parties for radical causes and minority underdogs had come to a screeching halt. Mr. and Mrs. Leonard Bernstein were severely criticized for entertaining Black Panthers in their Park Avenue duplex. Mrs. Randolph Guggenheimer got it for her spaghetti dinner for the Puerto Rican Young Lords. And Andrew Stein was denounced for inviting Cesar Chavez's grape pickers to his family's palatial Southampton mansion. Yet despite the critics, the days of such parties are far from past. But without subsidy, and the possibility of subsidy is another issue altogether, I cannot see that our Broadway theatre can be anything but a clearinghouse for dramatic ideas tried out elsewhere. It is no coincidence that almost all of the most interesting plays seen on Broadway during the past five years have been imports. They've been either imported from the rapidly developing American regional theatre or from London. Either way, they are plays that have been pre-tested by audiences and critics and sold to Broadway and Broadway backers as a package. If you're a small investor, the kind of person who buys 100 shares of Xerox or Jersey Standard once or twice a year, you're probably getting a black ball in Wall Street. Yes, the boys downtown aren't exactly clamoring for your business, as you must have noticed. Now, if you're a speculator, the kind of person who agrees with Howard Samuels that Wall Street is a place to lay a bet, you no doubt run into an even colder reception. Nobody's beating the drum to get the likes of you to buy Canadian mining stocks. But the fact is that Wall Street has begun to think really big. Now, either the Justice Department believes it is above the law when it conceives the necessity to be great enough, or else it wants potential criminals and subversives to think it so believes. The great danger in that, as the circuit court pointed out, is that if the government itself is a lawbreaker, or appears to be, it cannot for long expect anyone else to respect the law or those supposed to uphold it. 